Well, if you love tech, Palantir or AI, I've got a juicy one for you today as we've got two clips, one featuring co-founder and CEO Alex Karp and another their CTO, Sham Sankar. Enjoy. I talk to people in technology every day. These are software developers who are whose productivity has exploded using, say, Claude code um, and then uh, attaching themselves to like uh, Infor the informations from, say, Google Docs or even Notion. And it is incredible to them what they're able to do with the same budgets and even the same amount of time. So speak to what people are experiencing with AI today and the fear mongering, fear fomenting out of Bernie Sanders. A absolutely. I mean, examples like Claude Code, you can see how it's transforming the work of, of classically white collar workers. But I think the story that's really underreported is how AI is a blue collar revolution. It is the frontline factory worker. It is the ICU nurse who has more time to spend with their patients delivering life-saving care where minutes actually matter, less time munging and collecting the information on the patient. It is the manufacturing line where the foreman has to spend less time doing the production planning and the labor scheduling, more time actually building parts. And I think the key narrative violation that the Vanguard study really shows is not only are these workers more productive, these companies are able to hire more. I'll give you one example. We have a manufacturing customer that because they were able to streamline their production planning with AI, they were able to add a third shift. Without that labor utilization being at a certain rate, it wasn't profitable to hire more American workers. With it, more jobs are created. Mm -hmm. Or we look at Panasonic Energy. They're in Reno, Nevada. They build electric vehicle batteries. Uh, the apprenticeship to become a skilled battery technician on for this sort of equipment is three years. Mm -hmm. With AI, they've been able to take prior casino workers and gainfully employ them successfully mm -hmm. in three months. This is creating American jobs. And I think the root of this doomerism, first of all, it was, it, it's a complete propaganda shtick coming out of Silicon Valley where they want to talk about how powerful the tech is. It's so powerful, it might lead to mass unemployment. Mm. It's so powerful, it might end humanity. And that's just frankly not true. It's not what you see at the front lines. Mm. What you see is an opportunity for American greatness, an mm. opportunity to reindustrialize and build deterrence again. Yeah, let me jump in here. I, one of the narratives out there is it, it can work well for you know, the experienced worker who gets more productive. You talked about that, maybe the nurse or the frontline manufacturing worker. But it, it makes less space for the new worker because the other ones are so productive, you don't have to hire the young people coming out of college or whatever. How do you respond to that part of the narrative about AI job loss? I, I think the Panasonic Energy example is a really great example there where they're using AI to train their workforce and to accelerate the training time from three years to three months, which obviously improves the, the labor pool you can go after and the productivity of the worker, the ramp, the opportunities involved. So I, I think it's going to have a dramatic effect on how we uh, are able to hire, train, and deploy early talent as well. But I also, because it's the blue collar, white collar, I just think about AI and the tools that are already at people's fingertips. It could lead and will probably and will lead to an explosion of new businesses where you have an idea and the tools will be there for you to execute on that idea. And maybe like, College be doggone. I don't need to go to that's, college. That's, that's interesting. What about college? Does, it make, does this make college less relevant? I think colleges are going to have to reinvent themselves. We at Palantir, we started a, a meritocracy fellowship that takes high school mm -hmm. seniors and we provide them, you know, they're going to learn their techn technical skills on the job. And in nights and weekends, we bring in professors, we give them a well-rounded education mm -hmm. on the Western canon. Uh, I'm, I, I think colleges huh. are going to have to really rethink that's this. AI makes previously unprofitable operations viable, which creates entirely new positions that didn't exist before. Shamsanka describes a manufacturing customer that added a third shift specifically because AI streamed their production planning. Without that improvement in labor utilization, hiring more American workers wasn't profitable. AI made this expansion possible. Most conversations about AI and jobs start from the wrong place. They assume a fixed amount of work exists in the economy, and if machines do more of it, humans do less. Economists call this the lump of labor fallacy, and it's been wrong every time we've had a major technological shift. The third technological shift example Sham gives is worth spending some time on because it shows exactly how this works in practice. A manufacturing plant has fixed costs. The building, the equipment, 
and the management overhead. These costs exist whether you run one shift or three. When you only run one or two shifts, you're spreading those fixed costs across fewer production hours. Each unit you make carries a bigger share of the overhead. Now, imagine your production planning is a mess. Your foreman spends half his day figuring out which workers go where, which machines run which jobs, and how to sequence everything so nothing sits idle. That planning time is expensive. It slows everything down. It means you can't predict your output accurately. It means sometimes you have workers standing around waiting for instructions. In that environment, adding a third shift sounds great in theory, but falls apart in practice. You'd need another layer of management to handle the planning complexity. Your coordination costs would explode and the margin on that third shift's production probably wouldn't cover the additional overhead. This is where AI completely changed the maths. When production planning happens automatically, when the system already knows which workers are available and which machines are ready, suddenly that third shift becomes profitable. The coordination costs that made it impossible just disappeared. And then you can hire a whole new crew of workers. Night shift positions that didn't exist before, not replacing anyone from the first or second shift. Brand new jobs. This pattern repeats across industries whenever AI removes a bottleneck that was limiting scale. Healthcare is full of these bottlenecks. Emergency departments turn away patients, not because they lack beds, but because they lack the administrative capacity to process more admissions. Logistics companies face similar constraints. A trucking firm might have enough drivers and enough trucks to move more freight, but their dispatching becomes chaotic beyond a certain scale. Too many variables to optimize manually. So they leave money on the table. They turn down shipments they could technically handle. AI dispatch systems push that ceiling higher. More freight moved means more drivers hired. The Panasonic energy example Sean mentioned shows another angle of this. They build electric vehicles batteries in Nevada for Tesla. The apprenticeship for a skilled battery technician took three years because the knowledge transfer was slow and expensive. You needed experienced workers, mentoring new ones, correcting mistakes, explaining edge cases. That three year ramp meant a tiny pipeline of qualified workers. AI compressed that into three months. Now think about what's happening to the labor pool when your training bottleneck disappears. Suddenly you can hire from a much larger population, people who would never have waited three years for an apprenticeship can now enter the field. You haven't replaced any existing technicians, you've just made it possible to hire far more of them. Sharm's framing of AI as a blue collar revolution is important here. The public conversation about AI focuses almost entirely on knowledge work. Writers worried about ChatGPT, programmers worried about Copilot, lawyers worried about contract review automation. But the biggest gains are happening on factory floors and in hospitals and across supply chains. Places where the constraint was never intelligence, it was coordination. It was getting the right information to the right person at the right time so they could do their actual job instead of hunting for data. Silicon Valley pictures AI as artificial general intelligence slowly awakening to consciousness, mass unemployment as machines learn to do everything humans can do. They're given humans the information and time they need to use their judgment more effectively. The propaganda angle Sharm identifies has had real consequences. When the narrative says AI destroys jobs, policy follows. You get calls for regulation, taxation, and slow deployment, all based on a prediction that evidence doesn't even support. Every major technological transition in history has followed the same pattern. Short-term displacement in specific roles, long-term job creation as the economy restructures around new capabilities. The printing press didn't create permanent unemployment for scribes. It created entirely new industries around books. What's different about AI is the speed. Previous transitions played out over generations. This one is happening in years. That compression creates real challenges for workers who need to adapt quickly. But the solution is to accelerate training and skill development, exactly what Palantir is doing with their programs, like their meritocracy fellowship. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, a joyous new year, and a happy holiday to everyone celebrating. We at Palantir are deeply grateful for your support, your generosity. We know how courageous you, many of you have to been to support us in public and in private, while we attempt to support uh, the warfighters and others who do deeply important and often dangerous thing to secure our way of life that undergird the superiority of the West. We believe Palantir is a metaphor for the splendor and artistry and discipline necessary to build great things, what has made the West great over thousands of years. And one of the reasons I do this video on cross-country skiing is it's a very similar analogy. You train 
and train and train to get your VO2 max where it could work. You train the technique, you train strength, you train all year while everyone is having fun. You're just training and sleeping and training and working. And then you get to enjoy the splendor of gliding across the snow, gliding uphill, just suspending gravity. In many ways, that's what Palantir did in the last year, last couple of years. We suspended the gravity that was apparently the viscosity that was going to hold down the true greatness of our ability to make institutions, especially in the West, stronger, better, more secure, make American and other workers uh, uh, better in their job, raise their pricing parity, make American soldiers, warfighters, deadlier, safer, protect data, do these things that are cornerstone to the West. And we could not have done it without your help. And we are deeply grateful and hope every single one of you who supported us has a wonderful and joyous holiday. Thank you for all your help. Palantir's success comes from making bold decisions when the rest of the industry ran in the other direction. Working with the government and military when it was toxic in Silicon Valley. Embedding engineers directly with customers when everyone else sold software and walked away. Carl's message talks about the courage required to support Palantir publicly and privately about supporting war fighters doing dangerous work to secure the West. Palantir spent years building capabilities while everyone else was chasing consumer apps. Palantir made two strategic choices early on that defined everything that followed. Both, at the time, looked like mistakes. The first was focusing on government and military customers when Silicon Valley wanted nothing to do with them. Remember what tech looked like in the mid 2000s. Google's motto was don't be evil. The prestige path for an engineer meant working on consumer products with hundreds of millions of users. Defense contracts were the opposite. Slow procurement cycles, security clearances, cultural stigma that made recruitment harder. Palantir's founders saw something the industry missed. Government agencies had massive data problems and virtually no modern software to solve them. The intelligence community needed tools to connect information across agencies. The failure, not having that in place, left America open to attack. So Palantir built that for the customer and they learned things you can only learn in those environments. Defense customers push software harder than any commercial customer will. The stakes are life and death. The adversaries are sophisticated. The reliability requirements are absolute. Every capability built for government became technology they could later bring to commercial customers who needed the same battle-tested infrastructure. The second bold choice was the forward deployed engineer model. Traditional enterprise software works like this. The sales teams sell them the product, implementation consultants configure it, the customer gets a login and documentation, support tickets get filed when things break. Palantir rejected that completely. They put actual software engineers on site with customers, people who could write code, modify the product, and solve problems in real time. The industry thought this was crazy. The whole point of software is scalability. Build once, sell infinitely. Putting engineers on planes seemed like a service business pretending to be a software company. But Palantir understood something subtle. The failure mode for most enterprise AI deployments is the implementation. Software works fine in the demo when it meets messy data, weird edge cases, organizational politics, and users who don't want to change how they work. Most projects die in that gap. Forward deployed engineers close it. They learn how the customer's business actually operates. They see the problems the product team would never imagine, and they feed that knowledge back into the platform. Every deployment makes the product smarter. This also creates switching costs traditional software can't match. When an engineer has spent months embedded in your operations, building workflows specific to your needs, moving to a competitor means starting over from scratch. If I could recommend one place to start learning AI, it would be this course I put together. It's clear, structured, and designed for beginners who want to genuinely get knowledgeable about AI. You'll get lifetime access to all lessons, including future modules. And just a heads up, the price will be increasing as more modules are added. So it's currently at the lowest price you'll see. Also, it could make a good Christmas present. Check out the link in the description. Cheers. Most people pour money into ads people ignore. YouTube changes that, it builds trust, authority, and a real connection at scale. One law firm we worked with landed 33 clients in just five months worth $330,000 from their YouTube channel. If you run a business, this is one of the most overlooked opportunities right now. Book a call with me below and I can show you how we can make it happen.